we modern humans have become so hypnotized by the dazzling promises of new external man-made technologies that we forget that there exists within and around us an abundance of ancient, time-tested, pre-built technologies that are often even more powerful, efficient, and safe. Big business wants you to forget because these natural technologies, both out there in the world and within our own bodies, are their biggest threats and competitors. Ones that, if fully exposed and unleashed to the general public, blasted into everyone's conscious eyes, would crush these corporations' giant piggy banks. Nature is not only basically completely free and abundant, but also safe, easy to use, portable, efficient, reusable, and without many of the usual side effects or hidden costs. Once you remember that you have free and unlimited access to this natural technology right there within and in front of you and start getting into the habit of tapping into it, re-experiencing its smooth, gentle magic, you will gasp at what a fool you have been for ignoring it, gullibly assuming that newer is always better, that expensive is more excellent, and that man and society must know what is best. How much we have been overcomplicating our lives, continuously chasing newer and newer technologies and medicines and highs when we already have basically everything we could ever need. The garden of health is fully in bloom already in our own backyard. Instead of blowing up mountains or plowing through fields in search of new drugs and diamonds, injuring ourselves along the way, we could just pick them right off of the endless orchard of trees growing within and around us. Yes, man-made alien technology is also very powerful and useful. We also need it. It can give you a quick power-up or sometimes even an extra life or two. It can sail you towards safety and patch your broken heart and mind and boat. A useful plan D and E, but a risky A and B. Artificial electronics, drugs, pharmaceuticals, nutritional supplements, and food-like substances all have their time and place in our lives, yet too many of us have been abusing them, using them as a first resort, relying on them as a default habitual solution to our minor everyday problems, when in most cases, they should be the last resort, the final fix, the dynamite that blows up the bridge. If somehow we could live forever, never die, never run out of money, energy, or time, then I guess it wouldn't make a big difference. We could afford the sloppy side effects and long-term losses caused by them. But the fact is, we are finite creatures, energy and time-ticking mortals. Our time, money, and energy is, in most cases, limited. We are dying. This is all we've got. And in this busy, modern, fast-paced world, it is all getting sucked away and wasted at accelerating rates. We must learn how to protect these vital resources, learn how to use them more efficiently and economically. If we are ever to get out of this hypnotizing, nauseating hellhole that we've found ourselves spinning down into, the quicksand swimming through and clogging up our brains and veins, when times are good, we can afford to travel without a map, to build without a blueprint. We can take risks, skip steps, throw dollar bills and days and years into the air, live fast, die young, take the long way home. But when times are bad, when the storm is crashing down and we are shivering in the dark, cold forest, all alone, with nothing to eat and nowhere to go, we need a clearly defined strategy, a ranking of priorities 
types of actions in terms of risk to reward, a system that will not only get us back to base camp, but that will help us reach the majestic mountain peak. The willy-nilly, not-so-thought-out, wasteful strategies of the past that funneled us into this big, scary whirlpool of a mess must be scrapped and rebuilt with the long-term view, actual reality of the situation, and bigger picture in mind. Sure, things happen in life that are beyond our control. Not all of this is your fault, but it is during these impoverished, soul-crushing times that the reality of all of our past actions and strategies come boomeranging back, whacking us in the face, knocking out our teeth. So, of course this is partly your fault. You are responsible to an extent. You threw that boomerang, which was disguised as a twig or rock or piece of candy or something. We live and we learn. And now we are learning to not trust appearances because appearances are less than 1% of reality because an action is like a time-delayed pill with thousands of side effects that splinter out in every direction. Its effects are gradually unveiled over days, months, and years, spreading from your mouth to your body, to your family, to your country. You are now feeling the side effects of those pills that you casually swallowed long ago and forgot about. Nothing is pure accident. Things might look random and disconnected, but that's just because reality is interspliced throughout and scrambled across time and space, like mixed up letters in alphabet soup, spelling your destiny and name. The COVID-19 situation has pummeled so many of us down to new all-time lows, stripping us naked and stealing whatever little we had, forcing us to look at our raw selves in the mirror and reassess our life in order to prevent ourselves from ever again sinking back into these cold, painful depths, in order to get back up and fly once again through paradise and beyond, we need to stop, pause, and rethink what we are doing. No more drinking out of sippy cups or cleaning up broken glass with toothbrushes, drinking water from the ocean or washing your face in the toilet. We must become more efficient, resourceful, smart, and economical. The tools are available. We don't need to keep picking up pennies off the highway or trading in decades for possessions. Appearances are deceiving. They are the tip of the iceberg, 90 plus percent of which is hidden underwater. Invisible at first glance, but ultimately what will sink or save your ship. The true set of consequences of an action or technology food, medicine, or whatever is hidden underneath across time and space. You must zoom in, zoom out, and dive in down deep to see what it really is. That takes work and time, of course, but in the end, you will be rewarded, more informed and able to create a better set of strategies, ones that work for you in the long run and rarely let you down or surprise you flipping you inside out. On the surface and in the short term, one thing might look healthy, feel good, and seem to be the best solution. But as you dig in deeper and wider as time swims on and the data rises to the surface, your perception will change. The larger iceberg will begin to reveal itself, oftentimes with your dead frozen, screaming face trapped inside. Let's talk about how to mitigate that risk of getting trapped in the iceberg. Luckily, plenty of scientists and researchers have already done a lot of the work for us, and most of what they've revealed just confirms common sense and everyday experience, things that our body and mind are intuitively already trying to whisper to us but it's always good to review the basics, to spell it out consciously, to make sure that our overall plan and strategy is still on path. 
consistent with what works best. This is episode number 11, Brain Health Toolkit, the strategic hierarchy of tools. The basic skeleton of and concept behind what we are going to discuss today was, I have to mention, somewhat borrowed from and inspired by Andrew Huberman, someone who many of you are already probably very familiar with. Hands down, I think a lot of us would agree he is currently overall the number one best source for information on brain health and maybe all health for that matter. If you don't already subscribe to his podcast or YouTube channel or you've never even heard of him, I highly recommend checking them both out. I'll add links to them in the show notes. I am in no way affiliated with him, unfortunately, but I'm bringing him up just in case because he is a treasure trove of information and also because today's episode is sort of a remix of some of his ideas mashed together with my own. What I'm going to cover today is basically an overview, a super zoomed out lens for what this overall podcast is about, an outline of the various tiers or categories of topics that we will discuss over the coming weeks, months, and years, and how much weight or importance you should give to each kind of topic. A lot of this will sound like common sense, and I wasn't even going to mention any of this at first. I was, in fact, in the middle of diving straight into actual specific topics. Things like breathing, cacao, caffeine, alcohol, and sleep. And I've already released episodes on, for example, sunlight and certain foods. Yet midway through planning each of these coming episodes, I kept finding myself asking, why this topic? Why now? Is it really that important? Shouldn't we talk about the most important or fundamental things first to give priority to the most efficient and economical strategies and order the episodes accordingly. So I keep going back to the drawing board and honing in on what appears to be more fundamental and foundational, getting closer to where we should start. The problem with that though is that I'm still learning myself and also that's not how the creative muse works. Sometimes she wants to talk about cannabis, dopamine, or coconuts before even mentioning the clearly more important and macro things like sleep, exercise, and air. I'm not a robot. I can't go through the dictionary linearly from A to Z. I'm not chat GPT. Anyway, that would be boring for both you and me. I'm going to skip around from one section to another, jumping between levels of the jungle from the foundational strategies down there on the ground to the more supplementary or experimental ones up there in the canopy and air. It's all one interconnected jungle of information though. The levels are drawn for explanatory purposes to make things easier to understand and remember. Also, it would be a bit irresponsible of me to just zoom in on one little monkey or banana or bird or flower or branch in that vast jungle. That could mislead some of you into thinking that that monkey or bird is much bigger and more important than it actually is. So first, I want to share a panoramic snapshot of the overall environment. That's what today is all about. Andrew Huberman breaks down the different types of health strategies or tools into four basic levels in descending order of importance and overall safety and efficiency. Number one is always behavioral tools. That's where you should always start. Then number two, nutritional tools. After that comes number three, supplements. And last, if none of those are working or are not available, number four, drug-based pharmaceutical tools. You can call this the hierarchy of health tools. So the main pillar of health is behavior. If you want to change your physical or mental state 
behavioral tools are generally your best bet. They're going to give you the most bang for your buck, at least for most people. Not only are they less risky in terms of side effects and less costly in terms of time, money, energy, and availability, they are also often more potent and effective at transforming you into the desired state that you are seeking. With less volatility, fewer roller coaster ups and downs, and fewer hidden costs and surprises, they are what they are. The cards are face up on the table, openly loving and healing. No lies or secrets or hidden dungeons or handcuffs. They are trustworthy, reliable, and always there for you with no hidden ego, no secret agenda, no nasty secrets. A natural and free healing force that just exists publicly and innocently for any creature to tap into whenever it needs to. It's like a constantly flowing river that all humans, animals, plants, and bugs can drink from, bathe in, or play in at any time for as long as they want. It's there for you day and night. Make yourself at home here. We have inherited a wonderland of healing magic spread across nature from within the depths of our own body all the way out to the stars and planets light years away. It's all been time tested for millions and billions of years and it's free. It just comes included with the package pre-installed into the system, no questions asked, before going out seeking and shopping for more, buying things from sketchy vendors and wizards and websites and mortgaging your house, you would be wise to first take inventory of what you've already got and give that a try. See if it works. You might not need anything else. Behaviors are basically ways for us to tap into our natural resources, those technologies within our own bodies and out there in our natural environment. We're talking about things like air, water, heat, light, and sound. The naturally occurring physical, chemical, biological world full of all kinds of cool tools that together help process and provide these resources. Tools like organs, neurochemicals, hormones, bacteria, plants, animals, and stars. By engaging in certain actions or behaviors, we can use these natural tools and obtain the natural healing energy. It appears we are the pilot of this mysterious body of ours comprised of different parts and processes. Of course, we are not really sure how exactly this meat vehicle of ours works or how it was built or how best to use it, but we've figured out that by pushing certain buttons or pulling certain levers, we can change the way we move, think, and feel. The most powerful lever, the one that is going to overall be most effective, powerful, and economical in taking care of us is sleep. Whether you ask Andrew Huberman from Stanford or Matthew Walker from Berkeley or pretty much any brain researcher these days, they're going to tell you the same thing. Sleep should be your number one priority if you want a better brain and overall healthier body. If you want to function better in every sense of the term, if you could only have one tool in your toolkit, this would be it. It's your Swiss army knife that is going to cut away multiple problems all at once simultaneously and boost you up in countless other ways all at the same time with little to no effort. Literally, you just got to lay there, relax, and let it sweep you away. Big bang for your buck in whatever way you want to look at it. Sleep is the bedrock, the foundation of physical and mental health. If you're sacrificing sleep in place for anything, whether it be exercise, social life, or whatever, stop. At least 
if you want to create the most optimal version of yourself. If you want to learn more about the science of sleep, I recommend checking out Matthew Walker's book, Why We Sleep. Or if you prefer podcasts, he also has a podcast, the Matt Walker Podcast. Another book I recommend is Sleep Smarter by Sean Stevenson. He also hosts one of my favorite podcasts, which covers the whole gamut of health topics, the Model Health Show. Once again, these resources aren't exactly secrets. You might be thinking, duh, everybody knows about these shows and books already. But either way, I'm mentioning them here just in case because they're that good. I'll make sure to add links to all of this along with other resources in the show notes. Some of the other powerful behavioral tools that we have at our disposal that should be part of our first line of offense and defense include things like breathing, meditation, sun and light exposure, cold and hot exposure, movement-based exercise such as walking, stretching, swimming, lifting weights, or gentler movements like yoga, tai chi, and qigong. There are thousands of ways to exercise that everybody already knows about. I'm not going to list them all here. Just choose whatever combination of them that you like. Basically, move your body in whatever way you can and that feels good to you. Get as many of your body parts moving as often as possible. Yes, you can over-exercise, but you're usually fine because your body is naturally going to whisper and scream to you when to stop. The messages might be quieter and subtler at first, manifesting as subtle pain, and the closer you get to the danger zone, the more explicit and painful the messages will get. The pain or problem will increase in intensity until you start listening to it. And if all else fails, injury. The coach yanking you out of the game and putting you on the bench. You're not stupid though. You know when enough is enough, or at least you will learn sooner or later. You also don't want exercise to be getting in the way of the even more important things. Namely, like I mentioned before, sleep. Protect your sleep at all costs, even if it means not exercising or not eating that extra meal. So to sum this point up, move your body, but also stop moving your body. Find the right balance of movement and rest, and don't let one fully disrupt the other. You don't need to completely understand or be able to look at the -the behind-the-scenes engineering and chemical crew running the show. You can just perform the actions, the behaviors that work without understanding the science or mechanics behind it. It does help to peek behind the curtain at times at things like neurochemicals, hormones, body parts, and biological processes. By using this kind of technical vocabulary, you can connect it all together in meaningful new ways. Not only is it interesting to understand why things work the way they do, but by doing so, you can perhaps discover common themes and principles that connect the seemingly separate pieces of information together. But if you just want the solution without understanding the theory, processes, and calculations that led to that solution, that also totally works. That'll still get you most of the way there. For example, you can simply perform the action of getting morning sunlight or going to bed at a certain time. That'll do the trick. It'll run its code on you, whether you can read that code or not. But if you dig in deeper and learn how to read deeper and deeper concepts within that code, within that matrix, it'll be easier for you to further hack your mental and physical state by looking at it through the lens of hormonal concepts like melatonin, cortisol, vitamin D, ghrelin, leptin, brain waves, and things like that. You can connect this behavior of the morning sun exposure or going to bed early to other behaviors within that same 
overall conceptual framework. For example, the concept vitamin D connects up with the behavior of sun exposure to concepts like serotonin to melatonin and then to the behavior of going to sleep at night. All that also connects up with other behaviors like eating certain foods or taking certain supplements that contain a certain nutrient that promotes a certain set of behaviors that then go on to affect things like hormones, neurochemicals, and as a result, cascading out a further waterfall of behaviors, habits, and brain and physical states. It would be much easier to draw this all out as a literal web or network of information. But what I'm trying to say is the more individual nodes, aka concepts, you understand within the interconnected network of concepts, the more you can stop memorizing what to do and what not to do. Instead, you can look back and perceive the previously invisible processes going on in the background and how it all connects into a single network. You will more and more clearly be able to see how everything is just part of one overarching cycle of energy patterns, moving you together with everything else in this universe from resting calm states on one end to active excited states on the other. You can memorize the rules, have your cheat sheet, do the behaviors that work. That will still basically get you close enough to your destination, transport you to the mental and physical states that you want to be in. But each new concept you learn is like a new portal or entry point into specific states. And by essentially learning how to read and write the code, you can identify the common root that ties many of your problems together. See simple solutions that you might otherwise not be able to see. You can also begin to customize your own combinations of behaviors, putting you into just the right states at just the right times that work specifically for you. It might even open up and reveal new gateways that no one's yet discovered or at least paid much attention to. New ways of accessing brain and body states, new doorways to perception and action that no one thought of or noticed yet. This might be, for example, a new technology, medicine, exercise, business, or behavior that you discover or create, or new novel combinations of existing things that, when combined magically, as simple as those combinations might be, open up a totally new portal. And that new portal, however subtly different it might be from the existing portals, might just be the custom solution, the entry into a world that somebody, maybe yourself, needs. People suffering from severe conditions like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, PTSD, cancer, AIDS, the list goes on. Under such conditions, the normal set of tools might not be enough. There are additional ready-made cookie cutter solutions, drugs and technologies, for example, but they also don't always work and could even make things worse. The existing doorways or portals aren't consistently activated or working properly for everyone. Some people can walk right through them to the other side, to the land of health and happiness, while others keep bumping up against that frozen door, just getting blasted back down onto the ground again and again with nowhere to go, no other solution in sight. There appears to be no way out for some people. With limited doors and none that work for their specific manifestation of the condition combined with their specific biochemistry and history, they just remain trapped in the maze. I know most of us aren't going to become inventors or entrepreneurs or discoverers. You have to really dig into the 
underlying code to be able to do something like that successfully. Luckily, some people do exist who are curious enough and have the time and ability to dive into those depths and find or create new things to share with the world, to unlock new portals. We are indebted to these bodhisattva scientists. Still, it's all a matter of degree. You might not develop a new drug or invent a new technology or change the world, but you can by understanding and connecting more and more of the concepts, the nodes within the network, develop new habits and behaviors or discover new already existing, but for you, undiscovered foods, supplements, drugs, or technologies. That just might be what helps you or saves you. The more you travel down the learning educational road and hopefully also do some experiments, testing out different behaviors, foods, substances, and technologies along the way, seeing what works and doesn't work for you, the more you do all that kind of wild and crazy exploration and experimentation, testing out different substances, behaviors, and variables, the closer you will get to the answers. Find more of the keys and secret passageways that can unlock you from your problems and bring you closer to where you actually want to be. The adventure, though confusing and time-consuming, will pay off gradually, making your life better and better, sometimes in a zigzag kind of way, but ultimately up. Okay, that was a bit of a tangent. Let's get back on track. To sum up, you can get 80% of the benefits from behavioral tools, doing things like sleeping, getting proper sun exposure, and breathing in certain ways, and also avoiding certain behaviors like drinking too much alcohol, consuming caffeine too late in the day, or exposing yourself to artificial lights at night. There are a lot of behavioral do's and behavioral don'ts. Getting the proper mix of these will get you about 80% of the way to your destination. But if you want to tap into more of that extra 20% and these specific numbers are completely made up by me. It might be 70-30 or 60-40, but you get the point. If you want the rest of the effects, the ones that are contingent upon your individual biology and history, mental and physical makeup, etc., then it might be worth understanding and exploring the science behind why certain behaviors work or don't work. That will let you zoom out and see the overall processes that are running in the background to enter the matrix and tweak things yourself here and there to get them custom fit and tailored to you so they feel and work just right. This will also naturally lead you down other non-behavior-based pathways towards things like food, supplements, drugs, and man-made technologies and pharmaceuticals. But none of those should be your initial focus. You're better served mastering the biggest, most foundational tools and strategies first. After you've tried and implemented the various behavioral tools, after you've built that foundation of healthy habits where really most of your efforts should be focused because these behaviors are where you're really going to get the majority of the rewards with the least amount of risk, the most upside with the least downside, and also higher probability of success. Still, if after doing all that, you still want to make your brain even better, ever so slightly up your risk-taking, the Next step would be to focus on nutritional tools. Once again, I'm stealing this directly from Andrew Huberman, but it also is confirmed by my own experience and 
common sense. First, get things like sleep, breathing, temperature, and light exposure in check. And after that, you'll get the next most amount of bang for your buck from nutrition. This is the second most efficient, economical, and low-risk strategy. I preemptively already started covering this topic a bit in episodes two and three, and I'll continue to do a lot more episodes on this, of course, zooming in on specific nutrients and foods and drinks and how they affect our brain, how we can use or avoid certain foods or combinations or timings of foods to, for example, enter certain mental, perceptual, or physical states, how food affects things like sleep, focus, motivation, desire, creativity, and physical and mental performance, and zooming even further out, showing how food connects with the larger systems in our body, in society, in nature, and the universe. This category of nutrition encompasses all of those naturally occurring foods, plants, herbs, spices, and substances that give us life, starting at minerals, water, algae, and fruits and vegetables, and stopping somewhere in the realm of perhaps meat. There isn't a fine line that divides real food from fake food, nature from technology. So when we say that nutrition is your second line of offense and defense, your number two best strategy, we are mainly talking about nutrition that comes directly from the earth or at least close to it and that is less tainted by artificial substances. The more of a direct and pure descendant it is from the sun, the more it appears naturally in the wild without being manipulated by humans or other creatures, the better strategy it overall is. The more manipulation and processing involved, the further it gets away from this tier, tier number two, and it starts to move into tiers three and four, supplements and pharmaceuticals, respectively. And the more you move from tier one to tier four, the overall riskier and more dangerous it gets, as well as less efficient and economical. You really want to stay on tiers one and two, behavior and nutrition, as much as you can. This will usually solve most of your problems and get you most of the way to where you want to go. And it's a pretty smooth, not so bumpy road over here. But everyone is unique and many people need to venture beyond this natural world and into the more artificial and experimental territories of supplements and drugs. So the third most efficient, economical, and low risk, high reward natural strategy is supplements. It's tempting to just skip step one and two, skip the foods and skip the behavior and go straight to the supplements. These higher tiered tools are a lot more convenient and easy to consume. It's a lot easier to swallow some fish oil than to eat a whole fish or pop a vitamin C tablet instead of eating a pile of broccoli or oranges, but when possible, and I know this isn't groundbreaking advice, you're going to be much better off getting things in their natural, original form first. That pure whole food method is often not only much better absorbed and more potent, but also costs less money and is less likely to cause negative, unwanted, potentially dangerous side effects or to be a scam. So you know food works, you know behavior works, and that barring some kind of allergy or special condition or interaction, you're going to be safe engaging in most 
healthy behaviors and consuming most foods, assuming that they are in fact food and not secretly some kind of processed food-like substance mislabeled and advertised as food. Anyway, everything starts getting murkier and murkier in the realm of supplements. And that's not even to mention that just like behavior and nutrition, supplements is a very wide and loosely defined category. It includes not only vitamins and minerals, but also funky things like herbs and adaptogens. Of course, all of these things exist in nature and can be obtained from plants and foods. But here with supplements, you're getting an extracted, condensed, tightly packed in, and at least somewhat processed or packaged version of that stuff, packing that nature down into a tiny capsule, powder, or pill that allows you to obtain potentially much higher doses of it or combinations of it with other things in ways that you would not normally find in nature. Supplement producers extract the quote-unquote nutrients from their ordinary environment, rip them apart from their brothers and sisters and home, and repackage them into a dense, tiny space together with other kidnapped orphans like themselves, jamming them all into a little space that you can easily pop in your mouth, consuming the entire orphanage of a given nutrient. This is good because it makes carrying and transporting and consuming certain nutrients easier, and it allows you to receive the full punch of its specific superpower. But this is a double-edged sword. Because they can pack so much energy and information into such a tiny space, there is risk for overdose and abuse. Downloading that information into your body at speeds and volumes that your body was not designed or prepared for. That being said, for the most part, a lot of supplements seem to be safe and as long as you take the recommended dose and it doesn't interact negatively with other supplements, medications, foods, or behaviors, you're probably okay, but I'm not a doctor. And once again, supplements means a lot of different things. If what you're popping into your mouth does not align with your natural biology, that inner world of technology that has existed for centuries, it could gum up and break the system. Computers and electronics are not designed to get water poured onto them. Cars are not designed to use cola for fuel. And we were not designed to consume certain things or at least certain amounts or combinations of things. Keep in mind, this is where you're beginning to venture out of the natural realm that our body is used to and into the synthetic one where we are becoming a bit non-human or alien. We know more about the natural world and our body has lived in it for a long time. It's ancient, time-tested, and nature and ourselves have continued to coexist for a reason. These newer man-made things might be perfectly fine or indeed even better than the old things, but we can't say for certain just yet. They're too new, and though they're not that far removed from nature, from our own biology and the environment we evolved in, they are just synthetic and unpredictable enough to warrant some skepticism. Also, not only are there so many different kinds of supplements, but there are so many different supposed companies and people producing and selling them. Keep in mind, they're primary motivation is in most cases to make money. So that makes things even slimier. This whole realm just involves a lot more thinking, research, and skepticism to know if what you're popping in your mouth is safe, actually designed with your health in mind, or even effective 
at what it claims to do, once humans get involved in the manufacturing and selling process, the more room there is for deception, error, and accidents. If given the choice between a food and a supplement, it's a no-brainer. Go with the food. There are perhaps some exceptions to this. A lot of people don't like the taste of fish, for example, and also fish can be expensive or hard to catch. Nevertheless, omega-3s are really important. We need them or we will go bonkers. So even though technically it's better to eat the fish, that doesn't necessarily work for everybody. In that case, you gotta do your own risk assessment, but overall, it's probably better to get omega-3s from a capsule than to not get them at all. Same goes for other possibly hard-to-obtain or hard-to-consume yet vital nutrients like magnesium, vitamin D, and some of the B vitamins. No one is saying that you shouldn't take a multivitamin or dance with a few basic or fringe supplements here and there. I personally regularly consume a handful of them myself. They appear to provide me with cognitive and health benefits, ones that I might not be able to achieve otherwise. So, Basic point, a lot of supplements are basically fine and perhaps even good for you, but you got to do your research, maybe talk to your doctor and just keep in mind that they are not without risks, financial risks because you keep buying them, but they're not doing anything or health risks because they're actually secretly harming you. Also, obvious legal disclaimer here, I am not a doctor or scientist, or professor, or any of that. I'm a guy who is interested in and needs to learn about this stuff. Talk to your doctor or somebody who's smarter than me before doing anything reckless. This is especially true as we venture into the final, last resort tier, the land of no return, drugs and pharmaceuticals. All four of these tiers are, of course, connected. It's all one spectrum or network with natural technology on one end where most of the behavioral and nutritional tools reside and man-made technology on the opposite end where most of the supplements and pharmaceuticals reside. Each tier bleeds into the others and there's a blurry gray zone somewhat arbitrarily dividing each. So dancing on the border of drugs and pharmaceuticals, you could include things like processed food, electronic technologies, things like sugar, MSG, and high fructose corn syrup, but also things like smartphones, cars, and televisions. Some foods and technologies are essentially drugs, and some drugs are essentially supplements or even forms of nutrition sometimes. Also, all of these four levels react with one another. Pharmaceuticals affect one's nutrition, supplements, and behavior. Behavior affects nutrition, etc., and on and on. It's all one body, all one life, all one world. Nothing exists in an isolated box. There is a butterfly effect. There's no way to make a blanket statement about all foods or all drug-like substances or all man-made technologies either. This is a bizarre world where things often get miscategorized or put in the wrong box. So some of the things we currently call food perhaps should be reclassified as drugs or pharmaceuticals and someday will be. And some things that we currently call technology or electronics should be reclassified as drugs, pharmaceuticals, or even nutrients. We continue throughout our lives and throughout history to change and update our perceptions and categorizations of things. And regardless of the classification, like I said, every action or substance is still regardless going to interact with and ultimately bleed into everything else. It doesn't care what we think. What we're describing here might start in the shape 
of a hierarchy, the entry points can be classified in a somewhat hierarchical structure. We can put things into cute separate boxes, but in the end, after all the chain reactions have gone off, you're left with one big ball of everything. A tornado blowing the city into a single pile, like food on a plate, starting off all nice and clean and organized and separated, nothing touching, but in the end, re-merging back together into oneness, where it always was, just we couldn't see it. Your behaviors, nutrition, supplements, and pharmaceuticals, though somewhat divisible and separate from one another, at least at first, end up all mashed together at the end of the day into a single you, a single life, a single action or feeling. It all interacts and is interconnected and ultimately is one thing. So these levels of the hierarchy are just handy heuristics that get us to where we want to go and move us through the maze. But since we, along with our environment, are a single system, any input or output or change within that system is going to alter nearly every other part of that system and in doing so change the entire system itself. The higher up you go on this supposed health tool hierarchy, the more unpredictable yet also often sudden and dramatic those changes can be. Sudden dramatic change can be good, but it can also oftentimes be very bad, especially if you look at the larger picture of side effects, chain reactions, and so on. Back to the business of divisions, though. There is also this useful division we need to make between naturally occurring drugs, things a caveman or alien or child might innocently view as nutrition, and those man-made ones that fall into both or either of the categories called drugs and or pharmaceuticals. Things get super messy here and just trying to dissect it all is making my head explode, making me feel that the act of philosophizing or thinking about drugs is itself a drug-like action, not even to mention the fact that our body naturally produces most of the same feel-good chemicals that are found in supposed drugs anyway. Things like dopamine, serotonin, anandamide, and endorphins, not at the same dosage or velocity as many of these external drugs like methamphetamine, heroin, SSRIs, and antipsychotics, but the same basic stuff nonetheless. That high dosage and velocity provided by drugs is also, however, their magic. Since some humans don't have quote-unquote normal brains or bodies, they sometimes need abnormal methods and substances. Of course, the doctor or someone who knows what they're doing should be the judge of that. Words like drugs and pharmaceuticals clearly come with a lot of linguistic and cultural baggage and assumptions. So let's call this fourth category something else entirely. Let's call it the risky, complicated, abnormal, alien, unpredictable stuff. That stuff that often comes with high volatility, high velocity, sharp highs, followed suddenly, seemingly unpredictably by sharp lows. The things our body isn't quite used to that exist further off the beaten path, away from the normal human biology. Therefore, they can shock the body, put us on a roller coaster ride all over the place, through heaven and hell and everywhere in between. They have the potential to transport you into dimensions perhaps not accessible through your normal built-in inner and environmental set of technologies. They can literally transform your body, spirit, and mind in good ways and bad, allowing you to do or perceive things that you otherwise likely could not bringing you into potentially heavenly or hellish places and states of being, a plethora of potentially unwanted and much wanted side effects. Warning, this stuff is potent, a gamble, a speculative investment that may or may not pan out. A chance it might give you that castle, a 
state of happiness, peace, and success, or it might completely bankrupt your mind and body, driving you into disease, psychosis, misery, or death. The possibility of making dramatic, long-lasting, or permanent changes to you, either positively or negatively, but often negative, especially if you didn't start off with any major problems in the first place, changes that flip your world upside down for better or worse. This is the opposite of the gentle, smooth, safe, and predictable world of behavioral tools like sleep and sun exposure and nutritional tools like fruits, vegetables, and water. It is a rolling of dice with God on one side and Satan on another and varying levels of angels and beasts in between. Though certain probabilities have been determined by the researchers and scientists, though the dice is supposedly more likely to land on a certain side, according to the research, everybody reacts differently to these level 4 substances. And depending on the substance, sometimes you cannot play the game only once and then just leave and go home. It hooks you in, addicts you, possesses you, merges with you, making you keep rolling the dice, playing with it, consuming it, randomly jerking you up and down between dark, fiery pits and clear, colorful skies and promises that are too often broken, a never-ending roller coaster that you cannot get off of, one that at points you might even enjoy but ultimately is destroying you, making you sick, psychotic, sad, and mad. Even if it's not addicting, a single roll of the dice can put you on a temporary roller coaster. Sometimes it's like that tall tower thingy that lifts you up high and then suddenly plummets you down to the ground and then it's over. Other times it's like that 120 mile per hour blast off that calmly ends by backing up and dropping you off where you started. And then there's those full of loops and corkscrews and that never seem to end. The ones that leave you with a bloody nose and a barf covered shirt Except this time, all that blood and barf is on the inside, in your brain, in your cells. Okay, uh, enough of these horror stories. And if your kids are listening, I'm extra sorry. They'll probably only sleep on your floor for a couple of nights. Anyway, that's why we prefer using clean, simple words like drugs, medicine, and pharmaceuticals. They don't force you to get into this long, messy haunted house of an explanation and it's not even over yet buckle back up except this time relax we're going to look at the positive sides to those level four substances because they are full of so much potential because they have the power to transform you they can also serve as excellent cures or treatments for serious conditions sure still not without their side effects but still if you for example have certain psychiatric or cognitive disorders or conditions, if you have a serious health problem in your brain or any system within your body, these can seriously save you. Yes, they're not ideal and it's still wise to implement the behavioral, nutritional, and supplementation tools in addition to them. That can really skyrocket your improvement and perhaps even one day allow you to get off these freaking meds, unplug yourself from that machine. But some people, especially when even after reasonably implementing tiers one, two, and three, they still are stuck with a serious life altering problem or condition, one that seems to be radiating out from their brain or body, then this is exactly when it makes sense to talk to a doctor type person and discuss traveling to level four. Of course, you're technically free to venture into this wild realm on your own, but recognize by going at it naked or alone, you're only making a risky thing even riskier. When rolling that dice, however much you think you'll be okay, you really should have someone who knows what they're doing there together with you to guide you and take care of you across your potentially life-changing journey, just in case. Some of these substances and technologies are riskier, wilder, and more volatile than others. And the degree to which it skews towards that risky, dangerous, 
unknown extreme, the more careful you should be and the more you should look at it as a sort of last resort and definitely not your first attempted solution, your plan A. Perhaps you are a gambling man, but in this game, you really could lose it all. Is it worth it? I would even put things like alcohol, marijuana, television, and motorcycles, even cars, into this category. You can draw your own borders, but I think it's fair enough to say that these sorts of tools are generally in the risky, dangerous, unpredictable, volatile category. Definitely not making it into my first or second round of draft picks. Some things you might let sit on your bench, enter the game, and play for a minute or two. But some of these things are so crazy and dangerous that you can't even let them in the stadium or sit in the bleachers. Security's got to kick these guys out. But then again, like I said, sometimes these are just the kinds of guys you need when you're totally screwed and have no other way out. Also, they tend to be a lot of fun. Through their craziness, they might temporarily transform your life. But like all the crazy guys... You can never really relax around them. You never know how they're going to react and behave tomorrow. Anyway, as a general rule, don't put them on your starting lineup unless all the other players just aren't performing the way they're supposed to. Sometimes your best players are passed out, injured, or didn't show up, and you got to drag out that experimental cracked out kangaroo or AI-powered robot onto the court to go shoot some hoops and win this game. The kangaroo has been trained to play basketball. Technically, he can probably help you win, but it is a kangaroo, and sometimes it kicks and thrashes around, popping basketballs and popping secret nasty things out of its pouch and dirtying up the court. And the robot has been specifically designed to shoot basketballs and block shots and make rebounds. His slam dunk is out of this world, but they're still in the middle of working out all of its bugs and sometimes he suddenly starts shooting out sparks and, uh uh-oh, begins misidentifying human heads or babies as basketball hoops and the cotton candy machine as his master. He could win you a championship or destroy everything. Flipping everything upside down and inside out for better or worse until it's fully up to professional standards and has been time tested again and again. Just stick with the natural thing. Unless you've already tried all that and it is just not working. Still, this is never a light decision. So to sum up one last time before we go, there is a spectrum or hierarchy of tools ranging from low risk, low volatility, high predictability, and high efficiency on one end, and high risk, high volatility, low predictability, and low average efficiency on the other. This is my classification. It is not directly coming from Andrew Huberman. Like I said, this is a remix of his ideas with a lot of my own spin on it. So if I said something weird or controversial here, It's most likely not him. It's probably coming from me, from my funky DJ lips. What I'm borrowing from him is just a basic skeleton, the four levels or tiers of health tools, the hierarchy. To think of behavioral tools as a foundation of health and then working your way up from there with nutritional tools next in line, followed by supplements, and then certain pharmaceuticals and I would add technologies as your final set of tools. Not final as in the best or ultimate, but quite the opposite, your last resort or emergency kit. Of course, you could subdivide these four categories into however many smaller, narrower categories that you want. There's nothing special about the number four, except that it's easier to remember four categories than it is 50 or 100, but it's even easier to remember two, which is why I also framed it in that way. There are many ways to frame it, many systems for classifying and understanding things. Cut this pie up or melt it together in whatever way makes sense to you. The basic point and takeaway is start 
with the things that are most efficient, economical, and probably natural, and tread lightly the further you venture out towards the other side, where things get a little more unpredictable, murky, and that tend to be synthetic, artificial, and less synced up to our own inbuilt bodily and environmental technologies. And in terms of how the future of this podcast will go, I will not be covering topics in any specific order according to the framework outlined today. The fact that one episode is released earlier or later says nothing about its level of importance or how much you should focus on it. I would love to cover the most foundational topics first as those are the most useful, but they're also so big and far-reaching and often the hardest to understand. We know that certain behaviors, foods, and substances work and that others do not, but the code running in the background is so vast and often complex. It's hard enough to find it and read it and yet even harder to connect all the pieces together enough to be able to translate it into easy to digest, comprehensible language. It's easier to talk about an apple than an orchard, easier to get a good enough grasp on something somewhat specific like, say, oxygen or caffeine, even though those are still pretty big topics, than on the entire respiratory or nervous system or how they all interact and connect up with one another. Although we want to understand the entire rainforest, the entire ecosystem, to see all connections, interactions, and relationships across all time and space, between all the little creatures, organisms, and compounds in there, it makes sense to first just study a single tree frog or leaf, one piece at a time. This puzzle cannot be built in a day. Of course, everything in this universe and within ourselves, however much we try to isolate and simplify it, connects together with and is everything else. And language is really just an approximation tool for measuring and understanding and connecting things together anyway. It's always much messier and the web of connections is much more intricate than we'd like to believe or could ever comprehend. But by dividing the world up into different concepts and compartments, at least in the beginning, we can change the way we perceive, behave, and interact with the world. We can change our lives. Knowledge and language, however imprecise they are, help us live more smoothly and efficiently, merging back into our natural skin, a useful and coherent illusion that gets you approximately where you want to go is better than an invisible reality that leaves you standing still, doing nothing. It's better to use the GPS to get you to your destination, even if the display on the screen is an inaccurate representation of the underlying software, hardware, and code. Better to turn the key, fire up the engine, and drive somewhere than to just stay parked, frozen, on the side of the road, waiting until you know everything. There are certainly some kinds of tools that are more useful, reliable, and economical to use on that journey. There are better ways to drive, better fuels to put into your car, and better roads to go down. By having a smart strategy and by using the best tools, methods, and techniques, you will be able to reach your destination more quickly and efficiently, and the journey itself will also probably be a lot more smooth and enjoyable. Still, we don't all have access to the highest performing, most efficient vehicles, fuels, gadgets, maps, and tools. And even if you already technically have free access to the best things, the public highways, the sun in the sky, the air you breathe, you might not have consciously found all of them yet or not yet learned how to properly use them. 
We are so lucky that we live in an age in which we can learn from other past and present day explorers. Still, we must meet them or stumble upon and decipher their notes and reports. That whole secondhand information discovery process can be a big enough challenge in itself. So let's just keep learning as best as we can, trekking through that jungle and driving down that road, doing the best we can with whatever tools we have and can use. Remembering what tools work best for Homo sapiens and specifically ourselves in this body, in this time, in this place. The built-in prepackaged tools within and just beyond our skin in the body and in the natural environment tend to be what works best, but we also should not discount the things further out there, the new external experimental tools and technologies dancing on the horizon of our normal natural biology, the cyborgs that we might be able to become and the foreign planets we might be able to inhabit. It's all about finding and using the tools that will allow us to function most efficiently, economically, and optimally. I will zoom in and zoom out, capturing whatever tools or ideas, however big or small, that I can find. But it's not easy. Health and specifically learning about health and becoming healthier is an adventure through a jungle, a journey down a semi unpaved road. It's not an algorithm or math equation. Getting to the true reality of things is part of the idea, but maybe that's not even possible or where we should be focusing most of our efforts. In terms of priorities, functionality, efficiency, and usefulness might be more important and realistic targets for us incomplete mortals. More so than bigger, grander things like reality, knowledge, and truth. So while I'm going to try my best to chase down and capture the truth, I'm not going to let that get in the way of my health and ability to function more optimally. Action is the goal. I'm going to leave it at that for today. Stay tuned. I'll send you some snapshots whenever I find something cool. Also, please share with me and others anything interesting or useful that you find. We're in this together.